Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Louise Gardner, who will help moderate today's session. Louise is the Africa and Green Bond Coordinator for the Sustainable Banking Network, or SBN, which was established in 2012 with support from IFC. SBN is a community of financial sector regulators and banking associations from 35 emerging markets with a shared ambition to transform the financial sector towards greater environmental, social, and governance sustainability. So with that, I'll turn the webinar over to Louise. Thank you, Rashmika. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Rashmika, thank you so much, and thank you to the team in DC that helped put this together. Um, it's, uh, it's, I think it's part of SBN's ambition to be able to share a lot of this information more virtually to a wider community, and you've made that possible, so thank you very much. I'd also like to welcome and thank the co-hosts for today's webinar. Uh, so we have the Morocco Capital Markets Authority. Uh, they are a co-chair of the SBN Green Bond Working Group, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. And part of that role is they help us to share uh, not only the findings from the research that was done, but also sharing their personal stories and experiences from what they've done in Morocco. And I think that is, that is what is particularly valuable about today's uh, webinar. And then our research partner for this project was the Climate Bonds Initiative. We have Sean Kidney presenting today for us, and I'll introduce him in a second and hand over to his presentation. Um, but the Climate Bonds Initiative have positioned themselves as leaders on this topic, helping both regulators and issuers and investors to get involved in the green bond market in a practical way. Um, and this is very important because, as we can see from the other 400 registrations for this webinar, there were a lot of very practical questions around how do you make green bond markets work, and increasingly we also hear about social and sustainability bond markets. We won't be able to answer all those questions. Uh, it, we're focusing today particularly on the market creation side. So what is the role of regulators or capital market authorities in, in providing the framework that then enable issuers to come to market and also investors to have confidence in the credibility of the bonds that are being issued? And as the bond market matures, there are more and more questions around what are the underpinning environmental, social, and governance risk management components. And this is something that's particularly important for IFC. So IFC standards, sustainability standards for project finance, are a very are a wealth of technical uh, resources that enable better ESG risk management in a range of financial transactions. And so we're, as an issuer, IFC was therefore also very well positioned to be issuing green bonds at a very early stage. So the purpose of today is really from this discussion to start focusing on what is needed in Africa. So we know that there are a number of African countries that have built frameworks and they're starting to see issuance as a result of these frameworks being introduced. Uh, but there are also some challenges in terms of getting more if issuers involved, identifying pipelines for projects, structuring those deals, and getting local investors involved. So what else is needed, both at a national level, but also a regional level, because there are opportunities across national boundaries for um, uh, different types of issuance. And then what kind of collaboration is needed between regulators to make that possible? So those are the kinds of questions we're interested in today, but we do realize that there's a wide range of registrations uh, for this webinar. And Sean has very kindly agreed to do a little bit of the kind of Green Bond 101 uh, introduction just to make sure that we're, we're making this accessible to a wider audience. So what will happen after this? Uh, this, this webinar is part of the ongoing work of the SBN Green Bond Working Group. And it, it allows us to consult with a wider range of uh, stakeholders, mainly yourself. The questions that you put to us, the feedback that we get during the discussion, these are all going into the ongoing work that we do as regulators. So a little bit about the SBN. You heard the introduction from Rashmika. Uh, SBN was established in 2012, and it was on the invitation of 10 uh, or financial sector regulators and industry associations from 10 founding countries. And they approached the IFC and said, would we be willing to facilitate a knowledge network where they can more quickly share information with their peers and find out what's happening in other countries? And so the network has been so successful in terms of this knowledge sharing that we now represent 35 countries 
and that's approximately $43 trillion in assets, banking assets under management alone. And the SDN works with a focus on two parts of sustainable finance. The first is how do you build the capacity of local financial institutions and other financial players to manage environmental, social, and governmental ESG risks more effectively. But the other intention is to direct capital flows more towards sectors and projects that have environmental and social benefits. Um, and this represents the dual goals of the members that have joined SDN. They see this both as risk management and financial stability, but also as opportunity to achieve their national development goals um, and build resilience and competitiveness in their markets. So this is how we approach those two pillars. Um, and SDN has developed a global measurement methodology that you may be interested in, in, in investigating, which actually takes that to a granular level for how a country would do that. But for today's webinar, this is the result of work that was done through a particular technical working group that was established in October 2017 by SDN members who wanted to know more about the green bond trends and how they could create local green bond markets. And their question was, what is happening? Who is doing what? What is working? And what is the roadmap that I need to apply in my country to get this off the ground? And first things first, is this the right fit for my country? What do my capital markets look like? Uh, will, are green bonds the kind of instrument I should be looking at? Will things like green loans or other opportunities? So these very fundamental questions around how to get started, how to bring in other stakeholders, was at the root of this particular research. And so we partnered with uh, the Climate Bonds Initiative, who are already working in many countries. IFC provides advisory in many countries as well to help them get frameworks in place. And so we teamed up with them to pull these case studies together and start to bring out the lessons and develop the toolkit. So I'll be handing over to Sean in a moment, and he'll take us through the findings from the research that was conducted uh, through a survey of over 22 emerging markets. We had nine case studies, um, and we developed a very practical toolkit based on those experiences and inputs we received. And so Sean Kidney, a CEO of the um, Climate Bonds Initiative, I'm going to hand over to you to, set, to run us through the process of the research findings and how you think it applies to the African context. Thank you very much, Louise. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. As Louise says, the overarching the issue here, or the challenge, is to grow sustainable finance to meet Africa's needs. We have vast challenges. We are, in the next 30 years, going to be building a lot of cities in uh, Africa. We've already got a massive movement of people into um, urban developments. We know it's going to grow. We know that Lagos, for example, is predicted to be a city of 100 million people by the end of the century. It's roughly around 20 million, and that's going to be across the area. Making sure that we leapfrog to green from where we are now is really important. In other words, avoid the mistakes that we've made in Europe, America, and in China over the last 30 years with pollution, unsustainable cities, and so on. That's kind of underlying this. There's also an agricultural angle because we know that we're going to need a lot more food production, particularly in a world of volatile weather. Now, that's going to mean things like ensuring that we increase our capital investment in agriculture in the region. The Food and Agriculture Organization says that if we were to increase our agricultural investments at a scale commensurate with many other countries, then we could grow output by five times in Africa. So these are things that we've got to do going forward. And that underlines the need to be looking at sustainable finance. So just to be clear, a green bond is merely a labelled bond. You don't necessarily have to call it green for it to be green. So if someone invests in the Ethiopian railway bond when eventually they put out a public bond, it's still a green investment whether they call it green or climate. But the green bond's label, the formality of the label, has proven to be very attractive to investors around the world and to regulators, issuers, and investors as an idea. So I need to explain to you a little bit more what's in that as part of this process. This research that we've done in our partnership with the Sustainable Banking Network and the IFC has involved talking to 20 Sustainable Banking Network countries, 22 responses overall, 
variety of consultation and a series of case studies and regional studies as part of the process. We have needed to recreate all the time what a green bond is, and I'm just going to explain it to you today. This, in the way the market has ended up developing, is a vanilla bond, a standard bond, a bond exactly the same as any other bond with one distinguishing feature. The proceeds of the bond are allocated or invested in green projects or assets. Anyone who can issue a bond can issue a green bond. When we started this market, there were a lot of discussions about complicated coupons. You know, you get a higher interest rate if environmental objectives are met and so on. They've gone by the way, by wayside. This has become a vanilla market, which is a lot easier for investors as well as for issuers to be involved in. We've seen the growth from an initial base of development finance institutions, and the IFC really broke open this market by issuing two $1 billion benchmarks in 2013. Kudos to the IFC. We've now seen banks, private banks, utilities, municipalities, Cape Town notably, last year issuing a water bond, and we've seen sovereigns around the world issue green bonds. We've seen Sukuk too, out of Indonesia and Malaysia, essentially Islamic bond, which is similar in a way to an equity instrument. We've seen green loans appear. In the European market, we've seen green fund brief, green short shine, and various other variations on the greening of debt and then, of course, in South Africa, we've seen a green retail product where Nedbank, some years ago, issued a term deposit for retail investors where the proceeds went to renewable energy investments, and that was a great success for them as a customer acquisition strategy. So remember this, it's simple, but there are some rules. The rules for the formal labeling of the market involve disclosure up front about where you are planning to allocate the proceeds, fitting some protocols, the idea of an independent review of the green credentials that you're claiming by a second opinion provider, a verification agency, and so on, and annual reporting on the use of green bonds. That's essentially it. Not complicated, but there are rules. The rules are enshrined internationally in the green bond principles, and to a certain extent in terms of what is green in the work the climate bonds taxonomy has done. IFC has its own approach to this issue, but they're all similar. And now we're seeing that enshrined in local regulations, listing requirements, and so on. We'll come back to that in a minute. This is what the market looks like globally. As you see, very fast growth from 2015, 2014. You should see what the early years were, nothing. We've had a leveling off in 2018. We expect it to bounce back up to about 20, 250 billion of issuance US in 2019. There's been a, a reason why the Chinese market has been very flat because the government has been forcing banks to write off non-performing loans. Similarly in India, all sorts of things happening. The US has gone AWOL for reasons we won't discuss on this particular call, but you know what I mean. That might be changing, actually, because Verizon issued a $1 billion green bond in the last couple of days, which was fantastically successful. So we're hoping we will see progress. Although in the US, we've seen Fannie Mae, now the world's largest issuer of green bonds, issue asset-backed securities for residential mortgages, or in this case, more like public housing. And that's the yellow figure on the bottom of this particular chart. The market started with bonds allocated to renewable energy. We've now seen it develop into green buildings, 28% of the whole market has the money allocated to energy efficient, emissions efficient buildings. Transport, now 18% of the market, a mixture of electric rail, we have people like the French railway system issuing bonds, and also electric vehicles by people like BYD in China. And other areas too, water, Cape Town is a notable one in Africa about that, and various other sectors. If we keep going, you will see that in emerging markets, the market we've actually had a bit of growth in the last couple of years. That's quite a big chunk of growth and a change in the kinds of issuers. We've now seen 30% of issuers out of emerging markets. Now, in Africa, we've seen the biggest issuance from South Africa. A lot of that's quite old, by the way. 
Um, in the early years of this market, four or five years ago, Africa had a series of big, South Africa had a series of big issuances. Been quiet for a few years, came back last year of Cape Town. Morocco, led by the Capital Markets Authority, and we'll hear from them in a minute, have been notable in pioneering the market in Africa. We've seen a sovereign out of Nigeria allocated to renewable energy and forestry investments. And just recently, a little issuance out of Namibia, landmark, big in the context of Namibia's markets. Um, and again, you'll see the difference. This is dominated by green buildings and energy in Africa, with a few other areas that come into play. We expect that to diversify a lot in Africa as the market builds this year. Markets thrive on rules. We know that, particularly bond markets. It's been a market driven by voluntary rules to begin with. Um, green bond principles is organized by the International Capital Markets Authority. Climate bonds have focused on the what is green aspect, which has then been picked up by various parties around the world, the Chinese the, uh, regulators, and more recently, the European Union. It's now using the climate bonds approach to develop a European taxonomy of sustainable finance. Uh, the key features remain transparency, reporting, clear green definitions and independent reviews. In emerging markets, there's been a lot of talk about incentives, and this is a common feature of getting markets going. In that context, you need to have a little bit of regulatory support. And so China, when it introduced its green bond markets, brought in green bond regulations from the central bank, the People's Bank of China. And because China's got multiple regulators, the other regulators have also brought in their variations on that. China is now the world's second largest green bond market as a result of the push by the government. But of course, other SBN members have been doing this as well. We've seen issuance, uh, of, we've seen regulations coming out of ASEAN, ASEAN a couple of markets forum, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia have all done something. We've seen uh, work done in Brazil for listing guidance by the part of uh, Ferrobar and the Bankers Association in Mexico, in Chile, listing guidance, and of course in Africa, where we've seen uh, a few issues. I'll come back to that in a minute. In a number of the markets, the regulators have also introduced schemes to supervise the independent reviews in this market, notably China, Hong Kong, in Mexico, one is coming in soon. We're supporting the central bank on doing that. And in the European Union, under the proposed green bond standard, we will see this a feature later this year. Uh, these are some of the places that are brought in. Morocco was really the pioneer in terms of regulators in uh, the African continent. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But now we have regulations being developed in Nigeria and in Kenya as well. And then listing requirements in South Africa. Uh, essentially, these are based on the international laws. They are tailored to local requirements. Uh, there are occasionally tweaks, but they are broadly consistent with the international approach. Now, this is important. If we're to successfully attract international capital, but have guidelines and regulations that suit domestic needs, we've got to be having a clear eye on that harmonization. So far, so good. Um, if I move forward a little bit in Africa, the specific case studies are the Moroccan Capital Markets Authority. I'll leave that for a minute. The Securities and Exchange Commission of Nigeria have now got green bond regulations. This has been a, a, a quite a lot of work with the Capital Markets Committee and Ministry of Finance, consult, consulting with various parties. Climate bonds, IFC and UNEP have all been involved in that. In the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, we've now seen a green bond segment listing requirement. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange has been part of the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiatives globally, a leading player, and they've drawn from the knowledge in that particular market, aligned again with international criteria, developed locally. So, how do we take this forward? Well, we know that there is a requirement in emerging markets for guidance to make it easier. In Mexico, where the investors have told us unequivocally that they want Hacienda, the Ministry of Finance, or the Central Bank, to make it easy for them by issuing clear guidelines, we are bringing clear guidelines to market. In pretty well every emerging market we've spoken to, we've heard this kind of talk from investors particularly, and to a lesser extent from issuers and banks. So this is one of the reasons you've seen this development going forward. 
We know that there has to be work by many parties to make markets grow. Bond markets actually don't grow spontaneously as a rule. They are generally engineered by government action, public sector action, regulator action, and the support of different parties in different markets, notably stock exchanges. And that's exactly what's happening in green bond markets in each of these areas. We know there's a challenge with the capacity in regulatory agencies in many markets. It's one of the things that the Sustainable Net Banking Network is seeking to address with its work of different regulators. We know there's occasionally local demand isn't as strong as we'd like it to be. We have to look overseas initially, or we have to do, as we have done in Nigeria, engage with local investors to educate them and inform them about the nature of the opportunity. Nigeria is a good case study. The Pension Fund Association there, I'm going to say, has been incredibly positive, really a, a powerhouse of support for this whole idea. And the bond growth we expect to see in Nigeria will be domestic on the back of that now strong domestic demand for green bonds. That can work in other markets. In South Africa, it certainly has been domestic investors that have driven the market when we've seen issuance coming out. So this doesn't need to be engaged with international. It depends on the ability of the local pool, the volume of investor, investment demand available, the energy of the local pool versus the ability of low international investors to participate. As we know, the Naira is volatile. It's a little bit challenging for international investors. So the fact of being able to mobilize domestic has been fantastic. That isn't the case in other markets like Morocco where international investment is as important as domestic investment. Okay, we have problems with lack of supporting regulation. We're fixing that. We have problems of lack of qualified verifiers. We're fixing that. We bought in the big four accounting firms and educating them to be verifiers. We have some of the big international verification agencies like uh, DNVGL, who did the Nigerian bond supporting, and we are looking to grow a pool of domestic verifiers in the next year or two in major markets in Africa. There's been a challenge of finding pipeline of eligible assets. We are now looking how we can uncover the assets that are already there that we may not have realized are green. That, of course, means developing pipelines of green projects. It means educating issuers to bring their pipelines to market and essentially getting some demonstration issuance on them. So these are practical tools for markets, as well as something that the IFC has been particularly a leader on, how to integrate ESG risk and impact assessments at all stages of issuance. These are various things that we're working on. A few people have put up their hand for questions. We'll come to you in a minute at the end, we're just at the last couple of slides. So what are we trying to do? We're certainly trying to ensure alignment with international practices, learning from peers and common approaches. We do want to leapfrog to green markets, even where there's not a capital market, but we know there's opportunity to grow. We want to ensure quality, confidence in the green credentials as part of this. But also we need to have an eye on local market conditions and being able to be flexible to meet the demands of local markets. It's a challenge. We're looking for harmonization, not just between green definitions in different places from France to Kenya to Indonesia. But we're also looking at other growth of issues such as social and sustainability bonds, which are quite important developments globally in terms of triggering investor appetite for further allocations to these kinds of markets. In the European Union's high-level expert group of sustainable finance that I was had the privilege to be a member of, we actually started a mapping of the sustainable development goals across climate and green investments. We published this as an appendix to our report. We'll be doing more work on the European taxonomy of sustainable finance in the coming year on this topic, because for us, sustainable development goals are also climate resilience goals. To give you one provocative example, the education of women, often seen as totally unrelated to climate or green. We know that the more educated women are, the more they manage their families better, and you have a lower birth rate. That is crudely speaking. 
men reduce emissions. It's part of it. We know that the education of women has a direct correlation with their participation in the economic life of countries. As they participate in those countries, they build businesses, they improve the Gini coefficient of those countries. They reduce inequality. In a century of what will be severe weather volatility as a result of severe climate change, we are going to expect shocks back and forth in tropical zones in particular. Those economies have got to be resilient and they've got to be wealthier to be able to survive those shocks. Inequality is a number one indicator of a lack of resilience. Greater equality means more resilience. It's a climate investment, folks, and so on and so on and so on. We can send you more detail about that if you like, but this year, expect much more discussion about joining the Sustainable Development Goal theme that has been so important in the past few years to the Green and Climate theme to come up with a unified market. We have some challenges to get things going in the market. We know that we've got to do more about assessing markets, and this is the process to get a market going. Can we do this? Are there assets available? Do we need national guidelines? Initial education of investors and issuers? We know we need to look at training and investor engagement, as we've done in Nigeria. Sometimes we set up market development councils, such as we've done in Mexico and in Chile and in India, and we're looking at the moment of doing in Nigeria and Kenya. And we look at engaging indices and other market operators. In Nigeria, NSE and FMDQ, the two exchanges, are actively involved in supporting this. Of course, in Johannesburg, it's the Johannesburg Stock Exchange as a leader. And in uh, Morocco, the Casablanca Finance Centre has been a leader in this. And then at that point, we need to look at to see whether we need to go to international investors, whether incentives need to play a role, whether we need to get more demonstration issuance in the market, and how we grow verifiers. Demonstration issuance can be sovereigns, should be sovereigns, as Nigeria has shown. They provide liquidity into a market, and they give us benchmark pricing. Talk to your government, please. Here's a bit of a picture of what that roadmap looks like. I'm not going to go into the detail. I've covered it. I'm out of running out of time. We're looking at different sorts of capacity building support with the Sustainable Banking Network members. Please come back to us and ask for help if you need help. At that point, I'm going to sign off the formal part of the presentation and go back to questions. Thanks so much, Sean. Uh, can you hear me a bit better now? Yes. yes we are. Great. Yes. Sean, thanks so much. And I forgot to mention to the group that I'm actually I'm, I'm doing this webinar out of Cape Town, looking at an extremely hot city. Uh, we got our dams were filled uh, during the winter, uh, but we're still expecting to have water restrictions very soon in the summer. So we're feeling the impact of the drought very seriously. And so that green bond that the Cape Town, that's Cape Town issued, um, I think that's going to have to be put to work. Great. So we did have some questions coming through, and we have the next uh, eight or nine minutes to address some of these. If we don't get your questions now, we can also try during the discussion. Uh, so, Sean, I have a few clarification questions, firstly, to start, start with. The first one was the, the statistics that you provided for uh, green bond issuance. Can you talk about how these are defined as being green bonds? So how are they classified? Are they classified by the CBI or are the statistics based on information provided by the regulators uh, or issuing banks? In other words, what is the source of the data and who checks the quality of the data? Uh, good question, Louise. So the figures I've given you are the aggregate figures from the Climate Bonds Initiative tracks for issuance globally. They are also the figures you will see on the Thomson Reuters or Refinitiv database and in most reporting around the world. Uh, and Bloomberg as well is basically the same. How do we do this? Regulators are not reporting to us about what are green bonds in their markets and generally not providing that data to market. We review every single green bond issued anywhere in the world for the environmental quality and whether it broadly meets the green bond principles guidelines. We make a comment. Occasionally, very rarely, not yet in Africa, we knock a bond out. Now, what does that mean? It means we simply don't include it in our tracking database on our website. 
nor do we provide it in the raw green bonds monthly update we give to all the green bond indices and other parties. So there's a little bit of a control factor there. But what we're looking for in the assessment here is are the reporting and transparency measures in line of international practice or in a jurisdiction like China or Indonesia meeting the local regulations as well? That's a factor for us. We're very supportive of local regulators. We always have a look at that. And second, are the green claims broadly consistent with what we think and the people we've been consulting with around the world, such as the Chinese regulators think, are quality green investments? The only area where we have a difference with national guidelines on what is green is with the Chinese government. And that's purely because international investors are particularly gun shy of coal investments under the Paris Agreement trajectory. In China, the government has included new supercritical coal within the green catalog, obviously for reasons of air pollution. You knock out all the knocks and socks that ruin the air in Beijing and Shanghai if you put in a new green coal, a new coal investment. So there's a reason why. That is about to change, by the way. We expect coal to come out. And then the alignment between international investors' demands for a green and the Chinese system will become very much the same. With other regulators, we're fully aligned. In ASEAN, for example, the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum Association of Regulators specifically said no fossil fuels in line of international requirements and so on. So bringing all that together, giving us a global filter for what is green, we assess every single green bond. We review it, by the way, on our blog and our website if anyone's really that keen and interested. We can share data with you. And we make that a data available to many other parties, including, of course, the IFC and the SBN. And that's how we do it. If anyone would like more detail about the process and the rule sets in here, please do come back to us or go to our website where there is a ton of information that will keep you busy for a month. Great. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so we did get quite a few questions during the presentation that relate to what are seen as the most effective ways to start establishing a national framework. And I think some of that was answered through the slides that followed and uh, through things like the roadmap and the, um, the matrix, self-assessment matrix. So I'm going to skip those for now. Um, I think the presentation from Morocco will also answer those questions. So there was also a question around, uh, do you have examples of green bonds for forest? forest land degradation and fisheries. Sean, at that point, I'm, I'm going to assume the, the answer is yes, and that they should look to the CBI websites in terms of case studies. Is that correct? Uh, yes, in principle, but um, there's not a lot. Fisheries are not big capex items. Um, the Mozambique fisheries bonds didn't cut the mustard here, by the way, just in, for those of you that know that story, unsuccessful bond placement in the long run. Uh, but there have been some unusual ones, like from the Seychelles recently, a blue bond which essentially supports marine conservation. Uh, there's no bonds around where there's investment directly in fisheries. In terms of land degradation, you need to look at development banks and how they've been applying their green lending programs to find stuff there. But there are forestry bonds, such as Nigeria Sovereign. Please, our website, we've got a lot of detail on all of this. All right, and then there was another very good question around, do you think a bond, is a bond possible if the stock exchange market is very weak? And, I, and, and I'll also put, yeah. just to put a pin here. Yes, of course. Okay, sorry. Of course, look at, you know, uh, we, I'm hoping the Rwanda Development Bank will do a green bond this year. I think it'll go gangbusters in terms of investor demand. The stock exchange Rwanda is frankly so tiny it's going to be irrelevant to the bond issuance. They're doing a great job, that stock exchange, by the way, but there's just no correlation. Johannesburg's an entirely different beast, which is a big stock exchange, which has a big role. So no, it's not necessary, but where the stock exchange does play a national role, places like Kenya, for example, they can be really important to growing this market. But you can do an international bond from Fiji. They've done one sovereign bond. They're doing a second one. They placed it... 50% or 60% domestic investors and the rest of international, fantastic success on many counts, including, by the way, the column inches they've got in newspapers around the world. Honestly, I don't think Fiji's had that much sunlight in the last 30 years, that attention they got from that green bond. Now, so there's many different potential issuers. 
into different kinds of markets. If you're small, like Togo, you could still be doing a bond into the international markets, potentially, if you can get away a bond. Now, that's going to be a credit worthy issue and whether you've got the governance places, position place. Growing a domestic market, of course, depends on whether there are investments, whether there are other actors involved. That is intimately linked to can we grow capital markets. And the work we do in places like Kenya and Nigeria is to bring those two topics together. In India, we're looking at the green bond market, helping to drive the growth of corporate bond markets as part of it. So it is part of the whole issue, but you know, it's a country by country issue. Anyone who can issue a bond anywhere in the world can do a green bond, and frankly should, hey? Fabulous, and then there was a question around oversupply. Uh, so uh, the question from Khaled Ezeldin from Egypt, and he says, how can we make sure a market crisis of surplus of offering exceeding demand doesn't lead to declining prices or non-return points, like what happened with the carbon credits? Oh uh, God, I hope we have that problem. Honestly, I really, really hope we have that problem because I can tell you the demand is so strong for this bond everywhere around the world. Everything gets oversubscribed. And I'm looking forward to Egypt's first green bond, which I'm hoping will come out by mid-year. You know, this is a market where the demand, growth in demand, continues to dramatically outstrip the availability of supply. We've got a long way to go. Of course, to make this work, we have to learn some lessons from carbon markets. Keep it simple, guys. Boy, did we mess up CDM and so on with complexity and transaction costs. That's one of the things we're working on with regulators, the banks, the green bond principles to ensure transaction costs remain modest so it's easy, but nevertheless, there's a trustworthy and robust rule set. If we do this, if we keep it really low cost, we will continue to attract issuers and investors. You know, remember, there's a lot of people around the world who are concerned about the challenges to environment in the land of institutional investors. At the UN Climate Summit a few years ago, Ban Ki-moon Ban Ki heard from investors representing $60 trillion US saying that climate change was the longest, the most important long-term challenge facing their portfolios. They want to invest. A green bond is perfect because it meets their short-term risk yield requirements. It can swap in and out of a portfolio pretty easily. Plus, as a bonus feature, it addresses climate change or other environmental challenges. What's not to like? And as long as we keep it simple like that, this market will continue to grow gangbusters because, frankly, our environmental challenge is not going away for a while. And investors understand this is a problem for their portfolios. They've got to find ways to act. This is a way they can act. Great. Thanks, Sean. I'm going to give you one more question just because this is particularly interesting in the African context. So will SMEs be eligible to benefit from green bonds? And if yes, how will they be supported in issuing them? For instance, financing in agriculture is a challenge in Uganda. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a big issue. Um, we need to look at how we aggregate loans. You know, look, frankly, if I'm running a small factory in, in, uh, in, a, in Uganda, I don't have the capacity to issue a bond. The best I can get is get a loan from somewhere. So who's giving me a loan? that maybe could issue a bond. We've seen a lot of small actors in East Africa issue bonds, particularly solar and energy developers like uh, Lendable that essentially bundles up loans to households and turns them into an asset-backed securitization. There's work we can do there on aggregation vehicles. Of course, a bank is a kind of aggregation vehicle. So if we encourage banks to start programs with incentives like discount wholesale rates, they will grow the lending to the small business in Uganda as well. In some areas, there's a scope to create municipal finance corporations, which is what's been used in places like Canada and Scandinavia to ensure money goes to cities, to small cities. We think that this is something we need to be doing in Africa, which are essentially, again, aggregators. They are, let's take in uh, Kenya, you could have a Kenyan municipal finance corporation, borrows money on the wholesale markets for the first few years, it has a guarantee from the World Bank or the IFC or the African Development Bank, but its goal is to build up its own creditworthiness, to bring its municipalities up to scratch for creditworthiness, raise money at half a billion dollar or $100 million lots at a time, and lend it in $50,000 or $250,000 lots to towns around Kenya. This is how we did it in the West. We now need to do it in emerging markets. There's a bunch of things we can do, but the starting point, folks, 
is look at who can issue a bond now and whether they can grow a green lending program. And that's going to be microfinance institutions, banks, corporates. Fantastic. Thanks, Sean. Um, all right. So we're making good time. And I have the pleasure of handing over to the uh, Moroccan Capital Market Authority, the AMMC, who have been a champion for this work and a very able co-chair to the working group. Uh, so AMMC issued uh, guidelines for green bond issuance in 2016. And then in, in July last year, they upgraded those to cover social and sustainability bond issuance. And AMNC has been active not only in pushing the green bond market, but also sustainable finance more broadly in Africa. So they're going to share their experiences. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Janat Benida. She's the head of regulation unit at the AMMC. She is also an associate professor at the Mohammed V University of Rabat. And then Mr. Yasser Munsif, who's the head of corporate finance and financial disclosure at the AMMC. Um, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, we look forward to hearing Mar Morocco's experience. Thank you. Hello. Hello, guys. Hello. So uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for having us with you today and uh, for the IFC uh, for organizing this webinar and also to thank our co-hosts, uh, SBN and CBI. So it is really our pleasure to be here with you and to have the opportunity to introduce briefly our experience, our Moroccan experience regarding green bonds and uh, more broadly uh, sustainable finance. Uh, so let me introduce my colleague and co-speaker for today, yes, yes, and also myself, uh, Jeanette Basilia. Uh, so uh, this presentation will mainly focus on two areas. The first one is the Moroccan experience on fostering green finance, and the second aspect, which is the most important, I think, is uh, the main lessons learned and also the challenges that we still need to address as regulators. Okay. So uh, to place the Moroccan experience uh, in context, I would like to say that over the last two decades, Morocco has taken a number of initiatives and actions to address the complex and interlinked issues of sustainable development. Uh, indeed, uh, so Morocco engaged for several years in a voluntary approach to strike a balance between economic, social, and environmental considerations. And uh, the main proof is that the sustainable development is entered in our national constitution and translated also into concrete uh, actions. Uh, among these actions, we can mention two. Uh, the first one is uh, the National Sustainable Development Strategy, and the second one is the Renewable Energy Strategy. Uh, and we have here two objectives. The first one is to generate 42% of the energy needs from renewable sources. Uh, by 2020, when we say renewable sources, we mean uh, solar, uh, hydraulic, and wind. And uh, to 52% um, by 2030. So uh, aware that sustainable development goals need to be supported also by appropriate funding, Morocco has made consistent efforts to promote sustainable finance. So, uh, stimulating sustainable economic growth requires long-term funding. The financial system and particularly the capital market provide a venue for the mobilization of this long-term funding, and so it's the perfect occasion to meet between capital market and sustainable development. Uh, the Moroccan journey concerning the uh, um, concerning the, the green finance started in 2016 when Morocco hosted the COP22. Uh, on the side of this event, the Moroccan capital market and also other uh, financial sector actors like the stock exchange, or the central bank, etc., uh, organized an event, a side event, this is a conference called the Fostering Green Capital Markets in Africa. And uh, at the occasion of this, of this uh, side event, we launched two different roadmaps. First one is a national roadmap, and the second one 
is uh, continental roadmap. Both have uh, as objective to align the Moroccan or the African financial sector with sustainable development goals. And uh, we can talk later about the access and action plan issues uh, at this occasion. And uh, also uh, during the COP22, uh, we launched a continental initiative which is really important, and uh, it is um, uh, uh, the Marrakesh Pledge. We call it the Marrakesh Pledge. It's a call to action for all African regulators and also stock exchanges to join the move and to foster green capital markets in Africa through several actions. Among them, we can mention promoting Africa as a prominent region for green finance, enabling the development of an effective ecosystem, etc. Uh, to date, we have uh, 26 uh, signatories. To them, we have regulators and also exchanges. And we still wait for um, other regulators and exchanges to join the move and to help us foster again and more and more green capital markets in Africa. We also, uh, as a secretary of uh, the pledge, uh, manage a website that you can uh, visit. It's called Market Pledge, where all the exchanges and regulators that are signatories can share their, experience, their experiences. And um, we also plan to host an event uh, by the end of the year. Uh, to uh, have some capacity building at the regional level. We will talk later about this event. So uh, let's see now what happened after the COP22. Right after the COP22, uh, the IMC, Morocco, and particularly the IMC, undertook several actions that led uh, globally to a positive market uh, reaction. Uh, the first one was the publication of Green Bond Guidelines, November 2016. It was with the support of the IFC, and globally it describes the general rules and framework that is applicable to uh, green bond issuers in Morocco. And uh, the second one is uh, the issuance of uh, guidelines on corporate uh, social responsibility and issue voting. So uh, the here, the objective is different. We need to educate the public on the subject, especially each work, and to make them aware that they have some um, social and environmental obligations that they need to uh, respect. Then this year, as mentioned by Louis, on uh, July 2018, he updated the first guidelines, the Green Bond Guidelines, and now they are named uh, Sustainability uh, Bonds. Guidelines on sustainability bonds. It is a mix between social and green uh, bonds because we realize that uh, in our country, uh, as an emerging country, we still need to develop more and more uh, some social aspects that are directly linked to, uh, to green aspects, to the green project. We also <coughs> authorized two SRI funds, and with, in collaboration with uh, the stock exchange, we created an ESG index that ruled since uh, September 2018. So globally, we can see that the market reaction was really positive, and so we registered five issuance of uh, green bonds and social bonds also till now, uh, with a, a total amount of uh, $420 million. And uh, as you can find later in the, our presentation, the uh, issuers are really different. We find some energy agencies, banks, and also real estate uh, companies. So um, we can say that it was really a successful initiative. Let's move now to the challenges and also opportunities. Okay. Thank you, Jeanette, for uh, presenting the Moroccan experience. But uh, like any other experience, it's only value as valuable as the lessons that we derive from it. So what were the lessons we learned from uh, our, our experience? Uh, the first one uh, that, uh, that was mentioned by, by Sean and uh, also by Jeanette between the lines is that the starting point of any successful strategy with regard to developing green markets is 
really a political commitment, a high-level commitment to develop such uh, such instruments. But once this commitment acquired, then we the real work uh, can be can be started. And we have, from our experience, we have identified some axes that uh, constitute a recipe for success. Uh, the first the first axis is that uh, as a regulator or as an entity interested in developing uh, green markets you should uh, always seek convergence with international standards but without being uh, exclusive uh, as you may know there are a uh, few standards out there that broadly converge on their uh, principles, but you can find the differences in the details and taxonomies of eligible projects, etc. So um, from our experience, it is more productive to, uh, to require uh, convergence with international standards without choosing a standard at the expense of, of others. Also, as a regulator of uh, nascent market uh, to, to be created, you, you should seek balance between security and flexibility. Uh, for example, uh, uh, although, uh, although the, uh, the uh, international standards do not formally require uh, a third party review, we made the choice to, uh, to, uh, to require uh, that uh, any bond labeled as green to be issued on the Moroccan space should be uh, reviewed by an independent and qualified third party. Um, this is uh, important to ensure that the, uh, to avoid scandals that can hinder the development of, of a nascent and fragile market at, at their uh, early stages. Also, an important aspect is to build consensus around the regulatory model. We did so by issuing, by, uh, issuing uh, guidelines or regulations at, uh, at uh, different stages. We start by uh, publishing a draft guidelines, then we organize, uh, organize education events, and, uh, and we, uh, we try to collect a maximum of feedback of market actors, uh, then adjust if, uh, if it's necessary. And once the final guidelines are, uh, are drafted, then we put them, put them to the test with the first issues and on uh, the final stage, we embed them in the, in the, in the official regulation. Uh, by doing so, we are sure that all the interested actors adhere to the approach and that there are no, uh, no uh, problems. Uh, the second uh, important lesson is that networks and knowledge sharing is paramount to develop uh, green green markets. Uh, indeed, the trial, trial and error approach can be time consuming and can uh, and any small error can hinder the development of the market. So it is um, it is uh, paramount to uh, to seek alignment with international standards and to benefit from uh, what has been done on other markets. And the best venue to uh, achieve that is by adhering to networks such as SBN, SAC, or, uh, or other uh, networks. There are plenty of them. And the uh, experience sharing is uh, really interesting and very informative. Um, um, then you should know that uh, drafting the guidelines is not the end of the of the journey, but it's only the starting point. As there is, no matter what uh, how developed your uh, guidelines are, there uh, there will uh, always be a need for additional awareness dissemination and law and knowledge sharing among market players. Standards are evolving, so you should adapt to them in a continuous fashion. Uh, and uh, guidelines should uh, should uh, give rise to transaction in order to trans to real transactions in order to create a market. So there is an ongoing effort to be to be done by all involved entities. Uh, also, uh, guidelines on green bonds should not be considered as a as, as a unique uh, recipe to develop uh, sustainable markets, but should be part of an integrated approach and uh, any regulator should act on other levers 
to uh, foster and incentivize the development of this market. For example, uh, we can we can consider ESG reporting. Uh, we did so. Uh, we put in place a new uh, requirement of ESG reporting on uh, on issuers, and we think that this this can be an incentive to encourage going on uh, going to the tapping into sustainable uh, sustainable instruments uh, because it it gives incentive to uh, to issuers to have something to report on on their uh, ESG report. Uh, and other sustainable instruments should be considered also to expand the set of available uh, opportunities to be financed through the market. We did so by introducing guidelines. In addition to green bonds, we introduced guidelines on social bonds and sustainability bonds. Now, uh, we see that uh, the African continent is full of potential and has uh, real big opportunities on the, uh, when it comes to sustainable markets. Uh, first, in, in terms of uh, project pi of pipelines, uh, we know that Africa is significantly impacted by climate change, yet it, uh, it has a limited capacity to, uh, to adapt to those changes. Uh, Africa has also huge needs of, uh, in terms of infrastructure. Um, uh, the, uh, the African Development, Development Bank uh, speaks about uh, infrastructure investment needs of almost uh, $170 billion a year with a financing gap that can go up to $100 billion a year. So we see that there's a huge need in terms of, uh, of infrastructure. Uh, some African populations are uh, still very, very vulnerable, so there are a lot of social issues to be addressed there and, uh, and equally opportunities to issue sustainable instruments. And African countries are, uh, are involved in, uh, in, uh, in the global climate resilience uh, effort by taking public agreements, uh, for example, during the Paris Agreement. So we can say that there is no shortage of projects uh, in Africa. With regards to the uh, financial markets, uh, as we were saying, there is a huge need to, uh, to uh, adapt to climate change, yet only a small fraction of global uh, flows uh, goes to Africa. Uh, so there's potential to capture uh, financing. Uh, we see also there are dynamics of cooperation and integration between uh, African, African countries. Uh, there are commitments of the COP22 that uh, Janet spoke about. There are a few regional uh, financial markets out there. There is a dynamics of increasing South-South uh, APIs. So these are uh, these can be seen as real opportunities for uh, scaling up sustainable markets. Uh, however, there are not only opportunities, but there are challenges that need to be addressed. The first one uh, is uh, the convergence of frameworks. We need, as African countries, to have a common understanding of what is green and what is not. What we should attain a point uh, where what is green on a market it can be green on any African market. We need to have conversions of practical issuance requirements and processes so uh, that uh, to, to foster uh, transactions and even um, cross-border transactions of, uh, of uh, sustainable instruments. And also common transparency practices uh, about uh, sustainability and uh, ESG, ESG matters. In terms of uh, issue structuring, there are also uh, some, some challenges. Uh, the first one is that uh, the cost benefits of, uh, of issuing green bonds is not enough demonstrated. And we see that some issuers uh, may ask the question, why would I go uh, to issue a green bond knowing that there are a lot of costs uh, associated with it in terms of uh, external review, etc., drafting the frameworks, etc. So uh, there is a lack of uh, awareness about the benefits that come with uh, with green issuances. Uh, another challenge, I think, that uh, Sean talked talked about it is that the uh, 
some some projects do not reach the critical size necessary for attracting investors <coughs> investors uh, there are a lot of a uh, lot of opportunities and and projects in africa but uh, there are all the majority of them is uh, is uh, is too small to be financed by by big investors uh, so uh, it is important to uh, address this question, for example, by by encouraging the aggregation mechanisms, either via banks or uh, or other instruments. And the biggest uh, the biggest challenge is uh, is capacity building at uh, at the level of regulators, investors, issuers and professionals that are involved in these processes either uh, for review auditing or uh, or uh, or any or any other aspect as well as investors also to be able to uh, adequately uh, assess uh, sustainable sustainable merits of uh, of uh, given projects or or bonds uh, hence, the, in conclusion, I will reiterate that it is paramount to encourage cooperation and knowledge and experience sharing uh, among all the involved entities so we can uh, go, uh, go quickly because uh, we, do not have, uh, we don't have enough time. Well, thank you all for your, uh, for your attention and uh, questions are welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasser. That was very useful. We, got, we did get quite a few questions coming through. So I'm going to immediately dive in and uh, um, uh, share some of them with you. So one of them was related to, you talked about uh, explaining the benefits of green bonds over the costs in issuing them. So in your words, what are the key selling points to investors for a green bond issue? In other words, how can a green bond fit an investment portfolio? So <clears throat> there are a lot of benefits uh, uh, to to issue green bonds uh, for for issuers as well as for uh, for investors. We can talk about for for issuers, for example, the, the issuance of a green bond uh, participates in enlarging the investor base of the of the issuer, and hence it can uh, it can it can give uh, also price and benefits accordingly. Uh, of course, there is a big advantage in terms of image and uh, reputation in the sense that issuing a green bond allows the, the issuer to go public and speak about its, involvement, its involvement in the, uh, in the climate, uh, climate change matters, which is very important, especially with regards to uh, international investors who have uh, become very aware of those issues and uh, take them in consideration in, in their uh, investment. There is also an economic benefit with regards to maturity matching. For example, you, you, uh, uh, eligible projects generally have long maturities, so uh, it is difficult to find adequate financing for as long maturities as those. But uh, investors who are willing to invest in green bonds generally are willing to to uh, to commit for uh, these long maturities, and uh, there is also better risk management benefits for the issuer in the sense that it integrates extra financial dimensions and climate dimensions in their in their risk monitoring and uh, and management. All those are uh, indirect positive effects, <clears throat> but uh, we can think of uh, uh, more direct incentives that can be given to issuers. For example, uh, there, are, there can be tax incentives to encourage issuers to, to go green between brackets, or subsidies for compensating the costs that come with the issue, or, uh, for example, easing the constraints on, on uh, institutional investors, for example, by, by uh, adapting or uh, tweaking their uh, prudential rules to allow them for uh, more exposure on, uh, on uh, green instruments. I just wanted to say that, indeed, uh, the reputational effect is the major point that can lead uh, companies to uh, issue, issue uh, green bonds or sustainable bonds. 
And uh, what we uh, noticed in Morocco is that there is a great demand uh, from both sides, issuers and investors, even if there are not yet any incentives. But we really think that it's time to put on some incentives uh, if we want to go further and uh, encourage really uh, the issuance of more and more green bonds and also investors to go to this type of investment uh, instead of uh, conventional financial instruments. Fantastic, thank you. There's a related question, and this comes from the African Local Currency Bond Fund, the ALCB fund, uh, established in 2012, and this also feeds into the discussion around SMEs. So their fund aims to improve and diversify access to long-term funding and domestic domestic capital markets, particularly for SMEs. Um, and the question is, uh, one of the big challenges to convince issuers of this, uh, in, of this is perceived transaction cost and delay. So for green bonds, the question is often, if I do this extra work, will I get more investors or a better price? So you've answered that in part, but from the Morocco experience, to what extent did supply create its own demand? For instance, did bringing green bonds to market create demand for SRI investments and local investors? Did you see that kind of uh, cause and effect happen when you brought your framework, introduced your framework? Yes, uh, as Jeanette as, uh, was, uh, was presenting, up to now we have uh, five green bonds that were issued and we are hoping for more and more and uh, we are having uh, discussions with issuers that are interested in those mechanisms and willing to tap into the market. But uh, on the five issuances that we have, uh, the first uh, the first thing that we saw is that all of them were oversubscribed by a significant uh, by a significant uh, amount. Uh, so uh, we can already say that uh, proposing a green bond or, or a sustainable instrument into the market certainly enlarges the, uh, the investor base of, uh, of the issuer. Uh, for the cost benefits, I think that uh, we have the same, um, the same observations that, uh, that we can see uh, on a global scale is that the evidence is somehow mixed. You can find uh, price advantages, but it's not uh, it's, it's not really consistent. It really depends on case by case. But uh, for example, the last issue we have, which is a mix of uh, green and social bonds, we it, it was accompanied with uh, with the issuance of uh, of a classical or uh, or traditional bond, and we saw that for basically the same characteristics. Uh, in terms of maturity, in terms of, uh, of uh, coupons, etc., we had a lower spread for the uh, for the sustainable parts with regards to the traditional part. So we can say that uh, ultimately there are price advantages. Either they are enlarging the investor base, or or in a direct way on the on the on this on the issue spread. But there's, there is still no uh, empirical evidence uh, as the sector is still young and needs to develop more and more. Uh, we cannot uh, show clearly that uh, there is a direct effect on the prices. But what we are sure about is that the demand is uh, increasing more and more and uh, that the um, demand is important and led by institutional, local, but also international investors. And this is truly interesting. Great, thank you. Um, so here's a, a question that relates uh, very much to the research that was conducted and why it was done. Uh, so in the SBN network, the, the regulatory members were particularly interested to know how do they know that they're building the right kind of framework for the sector? Um, and how do they select from the international standards, the voluntary standards that are put in place, and how do they apply them locally? And one of the key issues is the challenge around defining what is green. So here's the question. Uh, and um, Sean, you can also stick up your hand or let me know if you want to, to dive into this as well. I think you spoke a little bit about the role that CBI has been playing in terms of green definitions at a global level. And there's obviously a lot of talk around 
Um, how do countries now go around go about developing catalogs or taxonomies that define green? So Jonathan, yes, yes. Sir. In terms of the Morocco experience, what were your challenges around defining green, and what are the social and environmental safeguards currently in place? So how is that working in practice for you? Um, well, the, our experience w went uh, as this. Uh, when we first were uh, thinking about developing uh, guidelines on, uh, on the green bonds, we naturally went to see what are the standards in place and uh, what are the existing standards or what are the differences and should we choose this one or the, or the other one. Um, uh, as I was saying, the, we found a few, few standards that were broadly converging. So we started asking ourselves um, which one is uh, is better and should we, uh, as a regulator, have a say uh, to define what's green or qualify what's uh, what's green and and what is not. We we came with the answer that as a regulator we don't have to qualify qualify projects or bonds as green or not for for a large number of reasons among which that the fact that we don't have the uh, the, um, the resources to do so because as you know uh, eligible projects are very diverse and uh, it it needs a uh, certain technical knowledge and expertise to be able to qualify a project uh, and uh, and define uh, define its uh, environmental benefits so the, the 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 solution that we found is that uh, to uh, to be able to issue a green bond in Morocco, you should uh, choose an international standard, and uh, there are not uh, hundreds of them. Uh, Sean spoke about the most prominent uh, most prominent uh, uh, standards, which are the green bonds principles. There is also the CBI framework and taxonomy, which is uh, very widely uh, spread and, uh, and you know. Um, and once you choose your, uh, your framework or, or standards, you should come up with a, with a third party review by a qualified and independent uh, third party. And uh, we think that this, this, uh, this solution is an equilibrium equilibrium that uh, allows us to uh, give flexibility to issuers to be able to finance uh, whatever project they have but at the same time giving security and avoiding the risks of uh, greenwashing and the misconduct on these uh, nascent segments of the market. And one of the first questions we asked ourselves while implementing a framework for green bonds and other uh, sustainable financial instruments was this one. Uh, is the framework right, the framework that we are adopting right? And uh, we didn't think about twice about it. We just did it the way we felt it, the way we observed that our um, the, uh, the other regulators were doing it uh, around the world. And uh, what helped us the most is uh, the fact that we joined a lot of network and that we uh, found ourselves uh, uh, helped by the IFT and other international institutions. Uh, as we said, it is really a young sector and uh, there are a lot of progress that still needs to be made. But we, while we implemented like uh, just guidelines and not uh, specific rules in our... Uh, so the principle-based yeah. approach. Yeah. yeah. So this approach has helped us a lot, and we still adapt it uh, uh, while observing the market and the market reaction. As, as Sean said, keep it simple. Yeah. Well, on that note, I also want to ask Sean to, to answer this question, because Sean, this goes very much to the heart of the work that you do in places like China and the EU. Uh, you're seeing the, the whole t discussion around taxonomies and definitions evolve. And I mean, obviously, when IFC provides its support to regulators, it's more in terms of helping to access the global knowledge and keep pace with what the best practices are. And that's something that we do in collaboration with ICMA and CBI. Um, so talk a little bit about where, where is this going in terms of solving the problem around definitions and, and the, the safeguards that support them? You know, 
um, detailed definitions are challenging. But as we start to bring in incentives, we're kind of forced to start tackling detailed definitions. I mean, if you're going to have risk weighting, for example, uh, for the capital ratio requirements of banks for green, as China is talking about introducing, as is the EU, you better be pretty clear about what is green. <laughs> Otherwise, those banks are great, but you know, they've got to try and explore every little corner. So um, specificity starts becoming important. In the early stages of developing a market, it's kind of looking to where you want to raise the funding either now or in the future. If you've got international investors on your horizon, well, look to see who's governing international investors is what I'm going to say. That's fairly clear. That's guidelines in, in, in Europe, the European Taxonomy, the Client Bonds Initiative. In China, if you want to raise money in China, you clearly need to meet the People's Bank of China guidelines. It's fairly simple. So I would be saying for African countries, where there is likely to be a mixture of domestic and international capital raising, the simplest thing to do is to keep in line with international guidelines and look there and save yourself a whole lot of effort. Uh, the European work that I'm in the middle of, which is translating the taxonomy of the MDBs and climate bonds into a European taxonomy, I'm going to say it's painful. We've got, I don't know, about 40 people working on various aspects of this. We're doing six years of work in six months. It's a huge effort. By the time we finished and we've harmonized the Chinese, oh, everyone here, it's on a platter. It's ours, free. Take it. I'm going to say that's going to be a lot easier for everyone. Now, there will always be situations where we need elaboration. So to give you an example in Canada, where the need to shift the resources industry away from fossil fuel intensive towards resources that are consistent with the green economy revolution we've got to have, need, they need to start identifying, well, you know, is nickel in, what about rare earths, et cetera, as part of that mixture. We're not doing that work in Europe. We're saying to Canadians, can you do that work and contribute to the international discussion? So the scope in places like South Africa to look for elaboration of an international architecture that a country can contribute, but it depends on resources availability to do the job. In the meantime, I think it's easiest just to look internationally. Um, but Louise, can I just add something more on pricing? Because I, I, I was just champing at the bit then when you were talking earlier. I really wanted to say something. <laughs> in, in, when you're issuing a bond, as our friends in Morocco have said, you get really high levels of subscription. It's investor diversification. It's a marketing tool. Now, if you're a treasurer in Senegal and you're able to get 20%, 40%, 60% new investors to your book, you can probably squeeze a couple of basis points, guys. Come on. That's what a treasurer does. You translate demand into lower prices. It's probably not going to show up in the data, but every treasurer worth their salt knows this. So let's be clear. Oversubscription is absolutely the norm. Stickiness, loyalty is the norm. You get people like KFW or like Yes Bank in India talking about the investors who like the green stuff become rusted on. That's worth money. And then as markets develop, you start getting other things happening. In, in liquid markets, and there aren't many, but USD, EUR, even Remimbi now, we start seeing the demand, the strength of demand, play out into strong secondary market performance. Investors buy this stuff. They tend to hold on to it because it's got a bonus feature. Think of it as a, a free electric car thrown in for your bond, which is the bonus feature of the climate change objectives being met as well as it meeting existing portfolio requirements. And so they tend not to sell. That means tight supply in the secondary market, premium pricing. We now have in Europe, the order books of green bonds being dominated by hedge funds who are pushing primary prices down, still hoping to flip into the secondary market and make money. There's a pricing benefit beginning to appear once we see liquidity. And we're getting halo effects. This doesn't require liquidity. There's a paper being presented at our conference. We've got a big annual climate change conference in London on the 6th and 7th of March. Please come, everyone. Freebies for emerging markets. Email me direct. We've got a session on pricing where we've got an academic paper on the halo effect for stock prices. So when people issue green bonds now, they're seeing their stock prices bunch up, bounce up because investors are using the green bond issuance, it would seem, as a signal 
that these guys are doing stuff which is going to make them less at risk are being addressed by policy and transition changes that everyone expects to see as the Paris Climate Change Agreement is inverted. So the pricing story is actually pretty fun, pretty interesting. In emerging markets, new countries, the minimum you're going to get is new investors. If you're someone issuing an USD and EUR from an emerging market, as we've seen repeatedly from India, you're going to benefit from the liquidity of, a, of USD and EUR markets. And by the way, we can get you good, cheap hedging from TCX, the Dutch government's hedging facility, if you want. Um, and it's going to make it worthwhile. So this is, this is where we are. In Nigeria, for domestic issuance, we're not going to see price benefit for domestic for a while. But we do expect to see it once we get a little bit of trading. And that's why it's so important to have the exchanges involved to help facilitate that process. Thanks for letting me go on. Sean, I have another question for you, which is quite important. And again, this speaks to the learning curve for regulators uh, navigating the principles that are out there, standards that are out there, uh, tools for establishing the local framework. So there was a point of clarification that the green bond principles are a set of guidelines and not a standard. And the CBI has a set of taxonomy and a standard developed from a set of criteria. Can you maybe just spend a, a minute or two clarifying how these various things fit together? So the market has developed with voluntary adherence to standards, promoted by consortiums of investors and banks and so on. Initially, development banks. So you saw the adoption of independent reviews by development banks, which laid the foundation. All of that was codified into the green bond principles, and that's been largely copied by regulators around the world. So the green bond principles are, look, if you're going to do this, you should do this. You don't have to. We still have issuers, a small number, who do their own thing. They basically say, trust me, it's green. That can work, particularly if you're a government body, and nearly all of those are US municipalities. They have some constraints on being able to um, hire verifiers because of the local regulatory decisions. But the, the principles are, are there. Now, once you start getting into incentive or regulatory environments, but incentives especially, you have to bring those principles into regulation. That's what China's done, and that's what the European Union is in the process of doing now. There's a working group looking at green bonds regulations, which will broadly mirror the green bond principles and the work we've done at the Club and Bond Standard, but put into regulation to provide certainty in the European market. So to varying degrees, this is required. Um, you've heard the story in Morocco. Different regulators around the world have decided to do something in this area. In ASEAN, there are guidelines issued by regulators. In Latin America, no regulator has yet put out, guideline, put out guidelines, but we'll see some this year. They're not necessarily... In, in India, they are. SEBI, the regulations govern the domestic market. You'll need to get approvals from SEBI and so on, different sort of rates. But as incentives come in, you've got to get specific. So you take those voluntary principles and you say, OK, look, guys, it's rule now, it's law. And that's what we're going to see in 2019. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm going to start wrapping up uh, shortly uh, because we do uh, we're, we're planning to finish in about five minutes. The line will stay, um, and I'll ask Russian to just explain if we can carry on the discussion after that. Uh, so there were some very good questions that came through, and we will be tracking these and following up on these in the next phase of the the green bond research. Um, I think one important question around the role of the IFC. And I'd like to just clarify uh, the fact that IFC is indeed working in different ways in the green bond space, um, and, and uh, quite actively so. And this comes from a consistent belief in uh, green bonds and sustainability bonds, and a long track record, track record as an institution applying environmental social and governance standards. Uh, now, those environmental, social, and governance standards have been developed through very rigorous stakeholder engagement. So they reflect um, a lot of what's required broadly with, in terms of project finance globally. So they provide very useful technical information, which we have found is useful to regulators uh, and financial institutions as they're setting up their own standards. So IFC's role in this is um, initially as an issuer, issuing our own green bonds based on our portfolio, and then getting involved in things, initiatives like the Green Bond Principles. Where, so we're a founding member of the International Green Bond Principles Executive Committee, working with others to help design, the, uh, design these principles. 
and then working with financial institution clients. So we're able to go into financial institutions and help them identify projects in their, uh, in their portfolios and assist them in learning about how to structure them in, in, in line with green bond requirements. And in this, IFC is aligning with the ICMA principles and working with partners like CBI. So the intention, and this extends through the sustainable bank banking network, is to just simply facilitate the knowledge sharing that is required. And as Jeanette and Yasser have pointed out, it's a very steep learning curve for a lot of regulators who don't often have the resources to be able to spend time making the mistakes themselves. And as Yasser said, it's costly making those mistakes. So we have fledgling green bond markets starting to emerge, and we're all working together to, to try and do so in the best way possible. And then the, I think the last piece that I, I should mention is IFC's role in establishing the Amundi Planet Emerging Green One Fund, which is the largest uh, green bond fund dedicated to emerging markets. Uh, so we work at arm's length uh, with Amundi. They're the ones um, managing that fund. And the role of IFC is to uh, support knowledge sharing and aware awareness raising, similar to what we're doing today. So I hope that answers some of the questions around IFC's role. And we will, as I said, follow up on the other questions that came through in the chat. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending. Um, and thank you to uh, CBI and AMMC. At this moment, I want to just hand back to Jeanette and Yasser. Do you have any closing remarks from your side? Okay. Well, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we don't have precise uh, points to address. We wish we could have more time to expand on the, on the experience and uh, we wish that uh, it was useful for the attendees of this event. And uh, good luck to everybody developing uh, green markets. And uh, can I, yeah, I just want to add that uh, other countries that are uh, wishing to implement uh, the green bond market or other instruments can directly uh, contact us for any further information. And they can also find all the documents, the guidelines on our website. But we remain available to talk a bit more about like, our experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, yes, because they've been so collaborative, um, we've got Jeanette and Yasser already lined up for other speaking events. One of them is the upcoming uh, we have an event on this report scheduled with the Johannesburg Stock Exchange in Johannesburg uh, on the 18th of February, and it'll be a country-focused discussion. We do have regulators from other African countries attending, including Kenya, uh, Nigeria, uh, and the AMMC from Morocco to share their exp experiences. Uh, so we expect to have other events like this in the future, and we look forward to having you on similar web webinars. Roshanika, can I hand over to you to close? Hi, thank you, Louise. I just wanted to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. Um, following this event, you'll receive an email with uh, a link to provide feedback. You see the link on your screen right now. We'll also send you a follow-up email uh, in about a week when the materials have been posted on our website. That will include the presentations and the recording of the webinar. So thank you all for attending today. Thanks, Roshanika. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.